Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to tonight's College Information and Financial Aid evening. My name is Rhonda Belosky, and I am one of the school counselors here at the Senior High School. I am joined today by Jennifer Rosado, who is another school counselor at NASH. And then in the back, greeting you is Mr. Kiggins from North Allegheny Intermediate School. So um, he's back there to help you if you have any questions from NAI. To give us and our panelists an idea of who's here tonight, if you could just please raise your hand if you're representing someone from NAI, which would be ninth and 10th grade. Any ninth and 10th grade parents? Okay, awesome. And then how about um, a show of hands for junior parents? Great, all right. And then how about our senior parents? Who are pro oh, nice. Going through that financial aid uh, process, hopefully. So we are very excited for our panelists that we have here today. We have a lot of knowledge that's going to be shared with you today. I'm just going to go down and introduce all of our panelists, and they have brought slideshows with, uh, with them today to talk about each of their schools. We have Heather Abrams from Pitt. We have Jeff Patak from Duquesne. We have Meg Ryan from Allegheny. We have Donnell White, Wright sorry, from Virginia Tech. And we have Jennifer Winge from the College of Worcester. They will be talking about their colleges, their application process, and give you some tips on those of you who are going through the application process now, or those of you who will be doing it shortly. Um, and then Meg Ryan from Allegheny will also be talking with you about the financial aid process, because a lot of our senior parents got that FAFSA opening on October 1st, so we want to make sure that you have all of your questions answered. Um, so the way tonight's going to go is we're going to go through our panelists one by one so they can talk to you about their school's application and admissions process. And then during their presentations, if you have questions, we have on the bottom of the screen a website that you can go to. It's www.menti.com. Once you get there, it will ask you to enter the code, and our code is at the bottom right of the screen. If you could just type that in, and then as the presenters are talking, if you have any questions, if you'll just type those in, Mrs. Rosado and I are going to be getting those questions on our laptop, and then after the presentations, we'll share your questions with them. If your question does not get answered due to time constraints, our reps will be here after the presentation for a little bit to answer, but we do have to be out of here by 8.30. Thank you. Oh, good evening, good evening. Again, my name is Donnell Wright, and I'm an admissions counselor at Virginia Tech. Um, just going forward with the presentation. Yeah, nice little picture I have there. It took me forever to actually create that. I'm not good at PowerPoints, but bear with me. <laughs> So for those who, who do have um, the booklet that I, that was provided for you guys, um, this is the booklet I'm referring to. Everyone can see me. Great people in the back. Yay. Um, so if you guys want to start with the back page and trifold it, I'm going to start there with our majors. So Virginia Tech has over, 100, has over 110 majors and over 200 minors and concentrations. So if you take that back page, trifold it, you s everybody see it? Cool, yay. Um, so that's all of our uh, 110 majors and over 200 minors and con concentrations. So even though we do have tech in our name, and we're most popular for our engineering and business. We, do, we are very uh, comprehensive and one of the more comprehensive colleges in the state of Virginia, um, where we do have seven colleges within our agriculture and life sciences, our architecture and urban studies, college of engineering, our uh, liberal arts and human sciences, natural resources and, and environment, uh, Pamplin College of Business, and our College of Science, um, specifically about our engineering program, uh, as that is one of our most popular ones. Uh, we, we are number 19 in the nation amongst engineering programs, but within that, uh, we have 14 majors going from aerospace engineering all the way to oceanography. So a little bit of everything within that engineering program, uh, but you apply directly into the engineering program, and from there, um, students will uh, go in as a general engineer, and that general engineer year as will serve as your freshman year to basically own in which the choice major jobs that you'll be going into. So a lot of our classes are very sequential. So instead of going in as an aerospace engineer, um, you go in as a general engineer to figure out what exactly you will want to do, and after that general engineer year, then you'll apply into aerospace engineering. That will supplement that the switching from aerospace to mechanical. Um, and then having to add another year or a semester to your experience at Virginia Tech, which means more money. And 
we don't want to do that. So in retrospect, that is the idea. Um, but those are our majors. And the last thing about majors at, at Virginia Tech is that we do have an undecided track. For those students who are very much so un undecided about what exactly they want to do, but they still want to attend Virginia Tech, students are able to go through our university studies and explore technologies. That is a two-year program where students are able to figure out exactly what they want to do with an advisor. That advisor will say, it will be me. We'll basically have a conversation with them to figure out what their passions are and steer them to a direct major that would be best for them. Um, and sorry, forgot the slide. <laughs> but um, in general, that's a great opportunity for students to go into to see what exactly um, they are interested in. Students who go into the university studies and explore technology are two times less to change their major and still graduate at the same rate as those who apply directly into their colleges. Um, so if you have any other questions outside of that, definitely see me afterwards. Um, next, on to our application process. Our application process, we've moved it v into a very holistic review um, into how we look at uh, the students. And we want to contextualize the experience students are having and when the context of their high schools um, so when I say holistic, we want to see who they are academically and as well as, the, as a person. Um, so when I say contextualize, you hear me say that a lot within that, um, is basically saying how successful the student was in the context of that high school they go to. So we're not going to compare you to uh, Mars area or Hampton or any other school in Pittsburgh or without the country. We're going to make sure you've done well uh, while you're here at this high school. And when I say that, uh, we want to look at your, your grades, we want to see A's and B's within that, and the academic rigor that is provided here at North Alabama. So we really want to make sure that the students are doing well in the context of that, and you have the SAT and ACT scores. We don't have a preference of either one. A's and, uh, we have the ACT and SAT, you can take both of them, we super score both of them, and we cross super score those scores because we only look at the math and sciences. Um, so we don't, when I say we only look at the math and sciences, we really just look at the math and sciences. You don't have to submit the writing portion of it. So the SAT with writing, you don't have to take the writing part or the ACT with writing. You just, the math and sciences. And I'm not saying just to take the subject test, but the for SAT and ACT, but we will only use those math and science scores to uh, create your score. Um, and cross super score notes, say you have an exam, say you have a higher score in the science section of the ACT, but you have a higher score in the math section on the, on the SAT, we'll take those two sections and make one big one out of it. So we're really trying to figure out a good image of how successful you are on those random Saturdays that you've taken that exam. Um, but the reason why we don't, you don't see GPA up there is because we want to get an idea of how successful you are in the context of your high school. So one, we have a, we have a high school in Virginia that's on a 6.0 scale, but what realistically is a 6.0 versus a 4.0? I don't know, maybe you guys, you know the answer, but I don't know, and we, we're not going to use that as, a, as an idea. So, and realistically, we want to make sure that the student is doing well in a context of that high school, and they have those A's and B's. And realistically, how I like to see things is that a four, there can be a student with a 4.0 that has, that took all the basic classes, all the required classes to graduate high school, versus a student that has a 4.0 with all the AP and IP courses or uh, calculus that the, the school provides. That person would have taken all of those rigorous classes will be more competitive and more prepared to transition into Virginia Tech than the other student. And that's what we want to see. So it's not based off that number that just only has a numerical value, but as well as the classes and what does that ideally say in the context of your high school. So that's going to be the academic side of the holistic review, but as well on the personal review, personal side is um, as well as seeing who that person is on the, in the context of that school and where you are and everything. You'll have a blank canvas to tell us any and everything that, you, that, that represents who you are. If you had a job during high school, tell us. If you're na naturally not from the United States, let us know. If you had a, you had a dog named Skip, let us know. We want to know every little thing about you because that sets you apart from those little things. Um, it, may, it, it adds value to your character. Um, that adds to our personal statements. So our OOT pros and profile is going to be um, four personal statements that we're on. One segue into that is that we're a completely coalition application. So we're not on the Common App, nor do we have our own school specific application. So strictly comp coalition application. Um, so we don't want the long, drawn out, fluffy 650 word essay. Nah, don't send that. Um, realistically, we have four personal statements, our UPROs and profile, which you'll see on there. And that's going to be on service, leadership, responder discrimination, and your future goals. So 120 words max on those. So 
literally not 121, just 120 on those topics. Each one has 120 words, and it's a good idea, a good opportunity for students to really tell us who they really are in the context of those prompts. Um, Ut prosum is our motto uh, in Latin that translates to that I may serve. Um, that's why we have it as that Ut prosum profile, but service is an, uh, it's integral to the Virginia Tech experience and how we do things. Um, but the last slide um, is gonna be our deadlines. Um, going back into the App, the holistic review as far as the personal and academic, they're weighted almost equally into those perspectives. So we're gonna look at not only the student academically challenging, but as well for how they contribute to society and how they contribute to the Virginia Tech experience. Um, but as far as our deadlines, we have early decision, early action, and regular decision. Um, just for those who are unaware of the difference between early decision and early action, early decision is that binding agreement that the student has with the university, uh, and that early action is a non-binding agreement the student has with the university. Um, students are able to apply to either one of those. The transition as students go, if you apply early decision, you can be admitted, denied, or deferred. If you're deferred into early action, you'll only be admitted or denied. Um, you won't go through the, the whole process of going to now regular decision. Um, our, our general role goal is if you're completely set on Virginia Tech, apply to Virginia Tech, but if you're not, if financial aid is contingent on your experience, then apply early action. Most of our students, uh, we expect to apply early action, so those seats will be filled mostly in that. So those students who may be interested, apply to uh, Virginia Tech, to the specific major in college during early action. Um, and as well as that, the February 22nd that you see up there, our hope is to get those financial aid packages um, processed with you guys with your decision. So on February 22nd, you'll be able to make that decision if Virginia Tech is there for you and comparative to other institutions by that May 1 decision date. Um, and that's pretty much Virginia Tech. Um, my name is Meg Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of Admissions and Financial Aid at Allegheny College. Allegheny College is conveniently located um, about an hour and a half north of North Allegheny. So some of you guys are probably familiar. We have a strong connection to the Pittsburgh area. I'm going to just give a little overview of the college itself. Allegheny was founded in 1815, so we are over 200 years old. We're uh, really proud of that history. We're the 32nd oldest college in the country. But along with that history, we're also really proud of the fact that our education is always changing and adapting. We were ranked one of the most innovative colleges, in fact, ranked number six. Um, and I think that that has to do with our education and the real world application that we really focus on when it comes to Allegheny College. We are a private liberal arts college and we are small in size. We're about 2,000 undergraduate students. And with that liberal arts education, we can be a really great fit for students who are really focused on knowing what they want to do and sometimes a really good fit for students who have really polarizing ideas. At Allegheny, we talk often about unusual combinations. So if you, um, we actually require that our students major and minor. And so if you want to come to Allegheny and major in business and minor in theater, that happens. We have students who come with really focused ideas, but also with that liberal arts education, we have a lot of students who come with a really broad idea of what they're thinking and just knowing that they want an, uh, that liberal arts experience, which means math, science, language, history. Um, what's great about our approach to liberal arts is that we don't have a required core curriculum. And so if you want to go through your four years at Allegheny without taking any more math, you can do that. Um, you can take as much math or as much language as you want. Um, we distribute our educational pr principles um, on what we call um, distributions, and they focus on things like power and privilege. You have to take a course in that area. It could be a history course, it could be a psychology course. You really get to take only classes that you're interested in. And so I mentioned our students have to choose a major and minor um, and fulfill those distribution requirements, and those usually happen very naturally. Uh, at the end of their four years, they all complete a senior research comprehensive. We call it the senior comp. And since we are the Allegheny Alligators, our seniors focus on chomping the comp. Um, it's a really great piece of research that our students get to take with them. Uh, it's pretty much master's level work. It's one of the reasons why Allegheny graduates do so well in the workplace. They're really great writers. Um, they have good experience of thinking on their own, developing their own questions and then uh, pursuing that and finding a solution. And so um, our graduates enter into the workforce and do some pretty impressive things. 
about 60% go straight into the workforce. 95% of them are employed within six months of graduation. The remaining go on to graduate school where we have acceptance rates into medical school and law school at twice the national average. Again, we'll point to the writing as one of our main reasons for that. Um, and then another 10% or so will focus on um, service or um, the Teach for America, Peace Corps, and programs along those lines. So now that you have the overview of the college, I'll just touch a little bit on our application process. Allegheny is really focused on access to uh, education and higher ed in general um, can be really confusing. You're gonna hear a lot of different perspectives. Um, our perspective is that we're really trying to make it as accessible as possible. So we will allow you to apply any possible way that you're interested, early decision, early action, early decision two, which is that still binding commitment, but we gave you a couple more months to think about it, um, and then regular decision. And most of our applications do come through regular decision, uh, although the early action follows a similar timeline, just pushes it up a little bit more. So if you want to follow along those lines without making a binding commitment, you can go early action, and our timelines are listed here uh, to demonstrate when you're hearing back from the different programs. When it comes to what we're looking for in an application, uh, we really are looking for well-rounded students. So uh, we do our best to put everything in context and we also do a holistic review. Uh, from the academic perspective, our uh, review will look at not only the courses that you've selected, but how well you've done it in each of those courses. Uh, just for some context, about 70% of our admits are in the top 25% of their class. So our students are genuinely pretty strong, um, though we have, uh, like I said, a lot of context when we're looking at our applications. And I know it's hard to do college searches, so we always provide the numbers when you ask about what does our SAT score or ACT score look like. They are listed here, but I wanna stress that we are a test optional school. And when we say test optional, we truly mean test optional. We don't mean test optional, but also think about this when it comes to scholarships because that can, can be the case. If you're really determined to, to take a big pool and narrow scholarships down, you might need test scores. We are truly test optional. About a third of our applicants do not submit test scores. So if you have taken tests and you don't feel like that is an accurate representation of your academic ability, don't send them. We simply ask on your application, do you plan to send test scores? And if you indicate that you do, we wait to receive them until we can consider that application complete. If you say, I don't plan on receiving or sending test scores, once we have your teacher recommendations and your counselor recommendations on file, we read the file. Um, so that's something to keep in mind uh, as you're going through the process. I mentioned we're all about access and so we also have our uh, application available uh, any which way you like. We usually say check with your counselors. Um, whatever they prefer is usually gonna make your life easier. So you can apply to us through the common application through the coalition application, and then we have our own Allegheny institutional app, and that's just hosted through our website. None of these have an application fee, um, but again, check with your counselors because it will make their lives easier when it comes to sending teacher recommendations through the system. And as part of that holistic review, we do read your essays, so it depends on the application that you're submitting, whether you're submitting personal statements or a personal essay. We do ask you to touch base on Allegheny specific questions in each of those applications. We take your counselor and teacher recommendations into consideration as well. And we do recommend an interview. Uh, it is not required as part of the process. It's a fairly informal interview. We'll do it uh, online, on the phone, um, or on campus, which is always what we recommend is coming to see campus, especially given that it's only about an hour and a half from here. Um, but that way you get to really learn firsthand what you might, your experience might be like at Allegheny and we can really help you figure your path out through the process. Uh, it also gives you the opportunity to provide any context that you think might be missing in your app. So if you had that bad concussion in sophomore year and your grades dipped, and you don't know if that's gonna come across in a recommendation, you can come interview and provide that, and we'll take that into consideration, add some notes, and that'll be included in your application file. And finally, just wrapping up with my last words of advice, schedule a visit is what I'll say. Um, to any college, it's always helpful, but especially if you're fairly within the region, I think what happens is that a lot of students know somebody that goes there, know somebody that plays on the soccer team. You go visit and you have a great experience, hopefully, and you figure that's all you need to know. If you're coming to visit, even if it's an informal visit, just stop by the Office of Admission and just have that conversation with your admission counselor. They'll get to know that face, because we are a small school, that's a really big part of our process. We really want this to be a personal experience. 
Um, and so that really helps if we get to know them. And that's my second piece of advice is get to know your admission counselor. I'd also say be authentic in the process. I've worked at a couple different institutions. I literally had a student say to me at my last institution, this is what I want to study. I said, we don't have that. And they said, I'm going to figure it out. It was like that student was focusing on other aspects of the college process and not thinking about the academics. And we also have students who ask us, like, I'm really politically active. I don't know if that's what I should write my essay about because maybe that person doesn't agree with my viewpoint. If you're authentic in the process, it will mean that you're at a right fit institution. And so that's really important, um, no matter what that question is. And lastly, for those students who are in the room, I will recommend that you own the process. It is wonderful if you have parents who help you through this, uh, but you, they should not be asking more questions than you are when you are on the tour. They will have questions. It's okay that they ask questions, but you should have more. Um, it's okay that they help you schedule some of these visits, but you're also only about a year away from being on your own entirely. So take ownership of some of that process uh, and really you know, start to think about what it's gonna be like when mom or dad is not there helping you all the way through everything. Good evening, everyone. So my name is Heather Abrams. I am Director of Visitor Engagement at the Pittsburgh campus. I am a Pitt alum, a two-time Pitt alum, so I bleed tons of blue and gold, but I'm also an NA alum, so I love NA. So anytime you guys need help, my business card's in the back. Do not hesitate. Call me, email me at any point. But I'm here to give you a very brief overview of the University of Pittsburgh. And with it, we were founded in 1787. We are a state-related school, which sometimes can get a little bit confusing. We are not a state school, nor are we a private school. We are state-related, so we get a very small bit of our funding from the state of Pennsylvania. And you'll see that in the fact that in-state tuition is going to be lower than out-of-state tuition. So that's pretty much where that comes into play. Now, some advice through the process. Some things to keep in mind. Meg hit the first one right on the head, and that's to visit your schools. Even though I know a lot of you think you know the University of Pittsburgh, you see us on TV, whether it's good, bad, or otherwise from our sporting events, or you just hear about us in the news from some of the research we're doing or the hospital system, but come and see campus. Until you step foot on that campus and until you see our students and interact with our students, you don't get that real feel of what it's like to be a Pitt student. And I wanna make sure that you all get that feel no matter what school you're going into, no matter what area you're trying to get into or your students trying to get into uh, actually for their major wise, have them go and visit because that can really make or break their process. They might think that they absolutely love a school and then they take the tour and they feel like they could never spend more than that tour on that campus. So it's a very important process. Another thing to keep in mind too is when you're going through the process or when your student's going through the process, make sure that they are always just taking a second glance at everything that they do, whether it's an email they send us, whether it's a short answer question that they do, whatever it is that they're taking time to send to us, make sure that they're double checking it. You could not imagine some of the things that we receive and we, uh, you think, you know, hmm, did they take time to read that? Or I know a lot of times students will use the same essays for different schools, but make sure they're putting the right school's name in the right essay that they're sending. Because the amount that I receive for different schools is, I mean, it's kind of alarming. So make sure they're taking the extra time. I know they're applying to multiple schools. I know that it's a very daunting process, but my biggest piece of advice is to help them and encourage them to figure out what's the most important to them. Maybe it's their top five, five things they're looking for in a school. And then as they're going on these visits or they're working with schools, they just check it off to say, yes, it has this, or yes, it has that, or no, it doesn't, and can I live without that? So that that can help to narrow it down at the end because if you're visiting multiple different schools, you might not remember what you saw at that first school compared to the last school. And so it's always good to have some type of a checklist. Now talking about our application process, we also try to make it as easy as possible for you. We have five freshman level entry schools at the University of Pittsburgh. And when a student applies to us, they have to apply to one of those five schools. It doesn't matter what major they pick under those schools, but they have to pick one of the five schools. Then in addition to that, we do have four regional campuses. So when they're applying to the University of Pittsburgh, you can only have one active application in the whole Pitt system at any time. So they're gonna be able to rank their regional campus just in case we're not able to offer them the Pittsburgh campus. 
we can offer them their next regional campus in line of the order that they want. We accept both forms of standardized test scores, SATs, ACTs, it does not matter to us which one, but like Virginia Tech, we are looking mostly not at that writing section. So we're not just focusing on the math and science, but we're not looking at writing at all. So we're gonna look at more of that English, the math, the science areas. We will do the best combined SAT score and then the best composite ACT score. We do a self-reported academic record, so they do not ever have to send us a transcript until they decide that Pitt is a place for them because they are going to self-report their transcripts and it really helps to expedite the process. So it helps us out and helps to get them a decision faster. We have three short answer questions that are not required, but you're all sitting in here and I'm telling you they are required. So make sure your students do them because it helps them to stand out. They're they're not required, but I mean, it just sets them aside, which is really nice. And we work off a rolling admission. So technically no dates, no deadlines. And typically our application will open in August. And it normally takes us about four to six weeks at that first time to get a decision back to them. If they wait until around November 1 to send us that application, which is that typical early action decision timeline, then it's gonna take us about eight weeks to get them a decision back because then we're flooded with applications by that time. So I always encourage you, get it out to us as soon as possible, as soon as it opens. Tip for the trade, if your student is a junior or younger, if you come and visit us over the summer between June and August for one of our admissions presentations or one of our programs, we'll waive your application fee also. Now, although I just told you we have no dates, no deadlines, I'm about to put up a slide of all deadlines. So. Here's some deadlines to keep in mind. October 1, the FAFSA opens. So technically not a deadline, but you're gonna hear Meg talk about that a lot in a moment. November 1 is our priority consideration deadline for PIT honors. Then we have the November 15th deadline, which is for the medical school guarantee that we have. Then a December 1st deadline for physician's assistance guarantee. We have a December 15th deadline for scholarship consideration a January 15th deadline for merit-based scholarship consideration. February is when we typically mail out our actual financial aid packages, and then of course the May 1 commit deadline. So not technically application deadlines, but things to keep in mind as you're going through the process, I wanna make sure it's in by this date because I wanna be considered for that medical school guarantee or whatever it is that your child is interested in. Now talking a little bit about our academic uh, profile. So our mid-range on the SAT is about a 1280 to 1420. 25% scores above that, 25% scores below that. Our mid-range on the ACT is about a 20, 28 to 33. Like Virginia Tech said, we are not going to ever post a actual GPA up there because it is just so hard to get because of schools being on so many different actual grading scales. So we like to see A's and B's also. And you'll see a couple things up there for some of our specific schools, like for engineering, you need to have math through trade, preferably calculus, you need to have physics, you need to have chemistry, but this can all be found online also. So please know that anything we say today for all of us, it's gonna be found online or in our materials in the back. But those are just some benchmarks to keep in mind. I don't want anyone to ever be scared by those numbers because like I said, we are a five campus system. And so if we aren't able to admit your students to the Pittsburgh campus, We'll keep them within the Pitt family and get them to one of our other campuses and they will still graduate with a University of Pittsburgh degree. But if you have more questions about us, do not hesitate, just come up and see me afterwards. Well, good evening everyone. My name is Jen Winge and I serve as the Dean of Admissions at the College of Worcester. Uh, it took me just a little over two hours uh, to arrive this evening. So we are just located in Northeast Ohio. We are a fully undergraduate residential liberal arts and sciences college. So a uh, lot of similarities between Allegheny and Worcester. Um, something that I'd, I'd li always like to make sure folks know about the College of Worcester is our global campus. We have 56 countries represented in that uh, population of 2,000 and 43 states. We have 22% of our students, U.S. students of color, and 15% of our students coming from a different country that are international status. And so we really are the most international campus in the state of Ohio and very proud of that. I think it's important to know a little bit about the intentionality of that 2,000 students. When you're looking at such different uh, institutions and understanding size and scope and what that means for you, 
but schools like Allegheny and Worcester, we're intentionally small, and we are also intentionally fully undergraduate. We want the focus to be on the teaching of our undergraduates versus just the research. And in fact, when research happens with our faculty, our students are typically brought along with that and have opportunities to co-author and co-present. So there's a very strong intentionality uh, regarding that focus and that philosophy of the liberal arts. Um, at Worcester, uh, we do have a very intentional curriculum. We have core requirements that are more like distributional requirements or themes um, that help us focus on the liberal arts. When you think of liberal arts, it has nothing to do with your political stance and it has nothing to do with studio art. Liberal arts is really a philosophy that to take on in terms of your college experience where you're being exposed to a variety of disciplines to help you develop and hone the skills that you need for any career, not just one job, but for any career and those lifelong skills that employers today are really looking for. Thinking of communication skills, written and oral, uh, critical thinking, analytical reasoning, creativity, innovation. Steve Jobs was one of the first folks to really talk about how technology cannot provide innovation alone, that liberal arts has to be part of that. And so, you know, places like Worcester and Allegheny, we're really dedicated to those types of experiences and exposure to help you uh, gain those skills. At Worcester, we do have a year-long uh, research experience, so every student has at least one class of one, whether mentored by a professor in uh, the department that they're studying. And it's not just a semester-long, but a year-long experience that's very intentional in how we um, build up to that experience. And we know that we can state that we're the premier college for mentored research, um, not just because we believe that, but others around us do. Um, just an example, Gallup uh, recently did research of its largest sample of college graduates, about 30,000 graduates uh, were sampled, and they were basically trying to get to the point of what um, types of college experiences or characteristics of a college helps graduates then experience um, great jobs, you know, feeling fulfilled in their, in their careers and in the workplace, but also feeling satisfied outside of the workplace and feeling good about their lives. And there were two uh, characteristics that really rose to the top in that, in that survey of 30,000 graduates. And one is having a mentor in college that really cared about you and got to know you more than just signing off on schedules for the next semester, but really asking about you and your life and your development while you're there but also taking a, on a long-term project that was more than six months long, but taking on that long-term project and being mentored. And that's exactly what Worcester does and does so well. In fact, the executive director of Gallup said, Worcester is doing exactly what needs to be happening to provide those great jobs and great lives. And then for 17 years now, uh, US News and World Report, I have my own opinions about the ranking side of that, but US News and World Report did do something well and they surveyed presidents and provosts and deans across the country and said, you know, what schools, what colleges out there are doing certain things best in terms of the college experience? So there were a couple different categories. And in two categories, uh, we have undergraduate research and this idea of a capstone experience, this long-term project in a senior year. And only two schools made both of those lists all 17 years since the inception of the survey, and that's Princeton and Worcester. So we're really proud of being recognized for the fully undergraduate institution that's best known for research and how our students take advantage of it. I know we've talked about this. Um, several of us have given examples of the application timeframe, so I won't go into too much detail specific uh, to Worcester, I will say that um, folks tend to ask, what are the benefits? And I think the easiest answer to that is the earlier you apply to an institution, usually you see then the higher the admit rate. And so when you apply earlier, whether it's rolling admission or it's through an early process like a binding early decision or early action, you will likely be part of a smaller applicant pool, right, than the regular. So at Worcester, for instance, we have 6,200 applications for a class of 550 students. And out of those um, 6,200 applications, roughly about 
170 of them applied early decision. So you are positioning yourself in a much smaller applicant pool when you apply earlier. Now we understand it's not for everyone. That's why we offer choices. We want to give you a window to apply and to be reviewed at a time that's best for you. But I think the reality is the earlier you apply, the, the higher the admit rate, you can position yourself better for that. So I think that's something to keep in mind. And I also think it's important to note that we're all part of a national association that follows ethics and we really um, stay true to those ethics. And one of those is not to provide benefits for going early decision. So if a school is saying, well, if you apply ED, you'll get your first housing choice or you'll you know, get a higher scholarship, that is actually going against our ethics um, and something that we like to enforce. And so please know that you should not feel that pressure for those benefits. It's, the benefit is really about what's best for you as a student uh, and when you want to wrap up your college search. We mentioned the common application. I think that's the, the most um, known out of those that we mentioned today, and that's because you're all working within Naviance and, and Common App is part of that. Coalition is now a growing organization. I know Virginia Tech just signed on this year, correct? So. There are um, a, a variety of schools that are using the coalition as their own um, and, and sole application or just varieties. So know that you will have some options and just to um, try to keep track of, of what those options are. But it's important to note that um, both memberships have a, a wide membership in terms of the types of schools and we do treat those as our own applications. We don't give preference one over the other. And not to be repetitive, but I do want to share and, and reinforce what Danelle was saying about context. You know, when, you're, when we have 6,200 applications and I have a staff of about 13 um, staff members that are reading, we can take time to review in detail and really understand and become in-house experts of North Allegheny. So obviously I have a staff member um, and with my own history of working with North Allegheny, we understand the type of curricular choices that you have and so when we look at an application from North Allegheny, we start there. We look at your curricular choices. And really, um, most importantly, we look for trajectory. You know, I, I, I listed here our, our minimums, right? And actually, your minimums to graduate are, are even further. You have four years of, of um, I believe, a social science. And so know that um, the most important thing for us is looking at growth and development as a student from freshman year on. And so our hope is we also see this upward trend in rigor, in, in, in course, coursework rigor, um, as well as performance. But I know it's really hard to hear this, for, and, and folks don't always believe us, but we would rather see more rigor and less of a, you know, a grade, like a lower grade, than just the opposite, taking you know, less selective courses and, and acing that class. So we want to make sure that you're well prepared for that transition. This is just giving you an idea of our, our freshman, our first year class profile. I mentioned the GPA. I actually don't have that anywhere in print, um, but I, I know that was something that was asked of us. So I wanted you to know um, uh, what, you know, our average GPA was a 3.7 and that's a weighted GPA. But of course, again, it's all about context and the rigor of those courses and how well you're doing in them. And then we've all talked a little bit about that holistic review and what's important to us. I consider the transcript the heart of the application, something that's really important to us, and I talked a little bit more about that. And I'll just mention, because of my background in teaching English, I want to give a shout out to the essay. <laughs> because when, the, the, when you think about the essay, it is the only part of the application that you have complete control over. You can influence your grades by working hard, um, and connecting, but when you think about it, the essay is what you have complete control over. So don't wait to the last minute to, to work on it. We could have a whole other evening presentation on the essay and how to craft it and have fun with it, but take advantage of that opportunity to share more about you, especially if you don't have an opportunity to interview at certain schools. This is a chance for us to get to know you beyond the numbers, so please take advantage of that. And I just wanted to make light a little bit about advice because we're giving a lot of advice, but really we want you to just take a deep breath, 
know that this process is different for every student. You may be just getting started and it, you're a senior or you're a ninth grader in the room trying to figure out what's first and what's, you know, what's the, what are the first steps. But we're here to ass assist you. You have great support with your counseling staff here at NA. Um, I always like to think of the college search as an important elective class. You probably don't have homework every night of the week with some of your electives, maybe you do, depending on the teacher, but you, pr you at least have one hour, maybe two hours at the most a week uh, when it comes to a, an, import in, an important elective uh, in your semester classes. So I like to think of the, the college search similar to that. If you as a family, as well as an individual, dedicate about an hour a week to the college search starting now, whether that's visiting a virtual tour online or requesting information or emailing a coach to let them know you're interested, um, whatever that may be, um, exploring the FAFSA, doing a net price calculator online, whatever those tools and opportunities are to work as a family, you'll find that it's quite manageable and it can actually be enjoyable. So, thank you. Testing, got me. Hi everybody. I'm Jeff Patak from Duquesne University. It's great to be here at North Allegheny tonight. Thank you. Um, I am not a grad, but my wife is. But I will not tell you what year because she would be mad if I made that public tonight. Um, but it's great to be have back here. Our family has a long history here at North Allegheny. But I'm here to introduce you to Duquesne University. Uh, Duquesne University, we are a private Catholic university, uh, about 20 minutes down McKnight Road, sometimes 50 minutes, sometimes an hour and a half, depending on traffic. Uh, but no, very close to North Allegheny. Um, we have a long and rich tradition here in the city of Pittsburgh. Um, Students generally find us through our academic programs and our academic reputation. Students from all over the world, all over the country, find Duquesne when you're searching the lists of US News and top program, top PA, top nursing. Our, our students do very well, and I think that's really what drives students to look at Duquesne first. Um, another great feature of the campus, if you've ever been to a Penguins game, or a Justin Timberlake concert, or anything at PBG Paints Arena, you've been right across the street from our campus. But many of you have not been up the hill to where at Duquesne actually is. But when you get to come and visit Duquesne, you'll see what the campus looks like. It's very quiet, we have trees and grass, so we have a great advantage of being right in the heart of the city of Pittsburgh, but still being able to offer students a nice private campus setting with everything they could potentially need right around them. Uh, the size of the school is usually a great fit for students that are looking for that. We're just under 10,000 students, about 6,000 undergrad, approximately 4,000 students actually live on campus. So it's not too big for students where it might be overwhelming, but not too small either. So it's a, a big enough size where they get all the amenities they need, but still smaller class sizes and a lot of support. The number we're really extremely proud of is that 90% retention rate at Duquesne. Students that apply to Duquesne and commit to Duquesne really want to be there. Um, we're a first choice for most of our students or a second 1A choice um, and they find that Duquesne is the right fit for them and that 90% retention means they stay at Duquesne because they really love the life they've developed down in the city but also the bright light at the end of the tunnel with uh, a great career and you know great academic programs. Okay. So a little intro to our school. Uh, moving along to application deadline dates, a lot of this will be the same, so I'll kind of speed up a little bit here, but uh, we are rolling admission school for most of our programs at Duquesne. Um, if any seniors have applied, we have not started reviewing just yet. We are gonna start reviewing uh, here probably in another week or so, so you have not missed anything yet. If you're wondering where your letter is, that will be going out. Generally, Duquesne acceptance letters start arriving in mailboxes usually around Halloween time or so. Um, but you'll see that we also do have early decisions, same as the other schools up here. The key dates to remember for Duquesne is really December 1st. So for anyone that is looking at the five programs above, biomedical engineering, OT pharmacy, RPA program, and physical therapy, December 1st is the date to remember. That's the one to put on the fridge. You apply to those, you have to have everything into Duquesne by those dates. At midnight that night, they shut it down and anyone who's complete we'll go ahead and get reviewed for those programs as well. Uh, we do have an application fee waiver, so if you apply before December 15th, there's no fee to apply to Duquesne. End of the year is, of course, our early decision enrollment. And then May 1st is the actual enrollment deposit deadline. But December 1st is the key date 
for a lot of our more competitive, uh, more in-demand programs you'll see listed there. Um, in terms of ish admission requirements, um, it does vary by program, and much like a lot of my colleagues up here in their schools, you'll see on our website we promote a 3.0 GPA in order to apply, but the GPA is, is not as important. We've talked a lot about transcripts, uh, courses students are taking, because we will see those 6.0 GPAs and 5.0s. We have to pull out our calculators and figure out what's going on there. Um, so while those are important, but it's really about the classes the student's taking. So, you know, we will um, require students to send in, of course, their transcript, um, SAT and ACT scores. We do super score those as well. Um, like some other colleagues up here, we are also test optional for several majors at Duquesne. Um, so that would be our business programs, liberal arts, and also our music programs. Um, so we have many students, we started this maybe three or four years ago, that were great Duquesne students, great GPAs, wonderful curriculum, involved in lots of activities, but they just did not test well. They can now come to Duquesne and do very well. So we do have test optional admission. Um, generally speaking, our health professions and science programs do require a higher GPA for acceptance um, and test scores, you know, um, for those programs, okay? Looking at uh, components in terms of what's required to apply, we do have an online application. It's straight through Duquesne's website. We're not a part of any other format. You go online, you apply. Nowadays, a lot different applying. So for some of the parents um, dating myself, uh, the way we applied back in the day was you filled out everything, you got all your essay together, recommendation letters, you packed it up and you shipped it out and you crossed your fingers. You know, you applied to a few schools. Nowadays, you could go onto our website, apply within five to 10 minutes today, and then send everything in, okay? So that's the way that we work our process. I'm sure a lot of schools are very similar, but you can apply first and then you'll be able to go online, start working with our processing team to figure out what you need to send in. You can track all that online. Has my essay you know, gotten there? Has my transcript been sent? Where are my test scores? So you can apply first and then start to send everything in. Um, we do want to see your transcripts, potentially for many students, their senior coursework as well to see how they're doing. Um, of course, your test scores. Letters of recommendations and essays are optional for many programs, but as soon as you apply, you will know exactly what you need to send in. It's all automated. You'll have a checklist that you can go through. But even if it is optional, we do encourage those essays to come through because we do think it's a great opportunity for students to share their story. Uh, maybe you had a bad freshman year, bad sophomore year, what happened there. It's a great way to really just tell us something that we can't really see just on a piece of paper. Okay. Um, in terms of the advice that I have for you guys, um, very similar. My number one is to apply. We spend a lot of time working with students and talking with students about is my test score high enough? Is my GPA? Should I wait to apply? What should I put in my essay? What should I put? You know, we want to encourage students, just get the process started with us. Let us help you with that application. Don't worry so much about this and that and what if and what if and what if. Get that application and let us start to work with you so we can help put together the best application possible for your student. Um, make the application personal. I love the story about um, not having the right school. Um, oh my gosh, that is like the form letter where it's like, you know, I really want to go to Duquesne. It's like different font size, different color, because you have a great PT program. I really love Duquesne, you know, and it's like you could tell they just, crossed off Villanova and put Duquesne in there. So don't do that. Make it personal about why Duquesne. Why is Duquesne important to you? What would it be like to be in the city? Why do you want to be in that program? Do you have a family history? You know, we want to hear all of those great things about why this particular program. I know our department chairs love to hear that from students that apply to our programs. You know, why does a student really want to be here? Not just because we have a good program, but what would it mean to them to be a student in the PT program at Duquesne. You know, those types of things are great. Visit schools, of course, was a big one that everyone talked about. Ask for help. Make sure, you know, call, email Duquesne if you're an applicant or you're going to be an applicant. A lot of questions out there about applying financial aid. Um, our job in admissions is to help you put together the best application possible. Um, I always joke and say, you know, we are the admissions department, not the rejection department. We want to help you get accepted to Duquesne, that's our job. So always call if you have questions about anything at all regarding the application process. 
and I think everyone also talked about this, just in try to enjoy it. Relax, breathe, deep breath, get the application in. For seniors, it's like, oh my gosh, I have to decide what I'm doing for the rest of my life tonight. Before I apply, you don't have to. Um, you have until May 1st to decide where you're going. For most programs and most schools, apply, get, get it started, visit schools, figure it out. It'll all work out for you guys, okay? Thank you. Hi there. Like Rhonda said, I'm Jen Rosado, one of the counselors at NASH, and I'm going to start reading off some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, if I do not get to your question, I completely apologize. Um, some of the questions I think can be found on the college's websites and things like that, but I will start with the first one. I'm actually gonna take it myself. A lot of people have been asking about rigor and high school curriculums, and how do they even know what our rigor is? So every high school in Pennsylvania and beyond and all the states, all high schools provide something called a high school profile to colleges. And in our profile, it explains the rigor of our curriculum. That might be the number and name of the AP courses we have here, the number and name of the honors courses that we have, um, things like that, how we weight our GPA, um, how it's cumulative. So colleges who maybe aren't as familiar with us as these schools are. Now these schools get a lot of applications from North Allegheny, so they might be more familiar with us than some smaller school in Florida. They would have to read through our profile to understand um, the competitiveness of our curriculum and then make a judgment call, did the student take advantage of the rigor um, supplied to them by their high school? Okay, so a couple of questions where you're gonna be able to just run down the line and just Tell me a number. How many years of world language would you like to see on a student's transcript? <laughs> or maybe not just a number. <laughs> so a pit is gonna depend upon the program you're going into. So that's why I said, ooh, it depends. Um, but typically in general, we wanna see three years of a foreign language with at least a B or better, but that greatly depends upon what program you're going into. But that's a good overall benchmark for us. You don't need languages for acceptance at Duquesne, but it can benefit you if you're looking at one of our liberal arts programs. You can actually get some credit for those. At Allegheny, it's great to be well-rounded, so I'd say two years is common, um, but not required. Uh, so we'll take everything into consideration. Um, at Virginia Tech, we basically take the whatever requirements that the school district has, uh, whether that's for, if it's two years or three years, it really depended on that. But if you're going directly into a language, it will best serve to do more years in a, in a foreign language or not. But uh, you can do those subject tests, things of that nature, to send those in to opt out of those things going further into our application. At Worcester, we do ask for two years of a world language. Um, we have made some exceptions to that on an individual basis, but overall I would say two years. And at Worcester, as part of that distribution experience of the liberal arts, um, we do ask for two years as well. How many letters of recommendation and from whom? I can start on this end. So at Worcester, we require one counselor recommendation with the school report and one teacher recommendation. We do allow more than one and we do read them um, and that I've done teacher workshops uh, to help with the re recommendation. They're like, do you actually read <laughs> this information? And please know that that is part of helping to really glean more about a student's engagement and growth in the classroom. So at least one um, of each. We don't require, nor do we want them. Um, any recommendations, don't send them to us. Um, we'll have them in your file, but we don't require them, nor would that be part of their admissions uh, process. Uh, we look. We want to know more about from who you are, from you, and not that you know a mayor and that mayor can speak glamoring things about you. So that's great. However, we want to know who you are, and that's part of our reprosal profile. Okay, at Allegheny, it's one counselor recommendation along with the school profile, um, as well as one teacher recommendation. Uh, and it's from the teacher who knows you best. So even if you're thinking sciences is for you, it doesn't, it can come from your English teacher if that's somebody that you've had for two years. So teacher that knows you best, if you're going to send more, which you can, we will read them, it should be new information. Um, so we do read them, but uh, if you're gonna have four science teachers all talk about how great you were in a lab course and that's the only context they knew you, would encourage you to branch out and think about that coach or another perspective if you're going to go beyond what's required. 
Uh, only required for our health science programs at Duquesne, and one to two is perfect. At Pitt, we're very similar to Virginia Tech, so like Donnell said, we do not require them, nor do we want them. The only time that we suggest that you do send one is if there's something that you can't explain. So if there's something you've gone through that, or your student's gone through that you want somebody else to explain to us that you think they could maybe explain it a little bit better, then that's when we would want a letter of recommendation. For Pitt, do you take a certain number of North Allegheny students? No, we do not. So last year you were the school that sent us the most applications out of any school in the United States. If every single student would be qualified, we would take them all. It's not like we are looking for a certain number, but we are looking very closely at that rigor and the scores and the GPA. To qualify for merit scholarships, is there a particular deadline? I know some of you had it in your slides, but others didn't. So to qualify for merit money, what's the date? Um, our merit, there's no deadline. It's just the deadlines that you saw. So I mean, as long as you're accepted, you'll be presented with the merit scholarship at Duquesne. Uh, Allegheny, it's the, again, along with the application. So we have no additional application for merit scholarships either, um, but once you apply, we automatically consider you. Um, at Virginia Tech, um, you have the you have the FAFSA. Make sure to have that in by uh, March one. That is our priority deadline. And as far as merit-based scholarships, we do have our general scholarship application that is due uh, January fifteenth. We do have specific merit-based and need-based scholarships specifically for out-of-state students to cover some of that cost. But that's going to be in that first page of the little booklet uh, that you guys picked up. So all those dates are going to be there um, for those. And at Worcester, it is similar where we work with our deadlines to apply. The only exception is we do have performing, um, performing arts scholarships uh, that are specific to students interested in theater, dance, and vocal instrumental music, as, and theater can obviously include uh, directing, set design. And these are scholarships that do then require an audition. So we work with the departments and have separate deadlines for that. And that merit money can be added then to the merit scholarship that you receive through the admissions office. At North Allegheny, we have well over 50 college and high school classes. Some are offered through the University of Pittsburgh, La Roche, um, Carlo College, for example. Um, typically, do you know that your registrar's offices accept these credits? So we'll accept any college class that you take as a high school student or your student takes as long as it's a C or better. The only caveat that I like to put out there though is if your student is taking a PIT class, that is their PIT grade. So if they get an A in their PIT class, congratulations, your student already has a 4.0 at the University of Pittsburgh. If they fail a PIT college and high school course, they then have an F on their transcript at PIT also. So please just be weary, any other college and high school course or any other college class they're taking, it will just come in as a, it won't come in with a grade, it will just come in with the credits. Same thing, C or better for Duquesne in order to transfer those in. Today, uh, it's very similar to AP credits that it would be evaluated by the registrar, so it would depend on the course itself um, as well as the grade. Very same, it's dependent on the course itself. C or better in general. For those, um, we do have a transfer guide on our website that students are able to go into since we have a lot of applications coming from NA. Um, we may have that on our uh, system as far as what things transfer over and that you guys can see then. And at Worcester, we do accept AP credit and transfer, but I will have to say I'm the outlier here. Um, I travel around with Case Western a lot and we tend to be the outliers in terms of transfer credit, but with college and high school experience, um, we do not accept credit that's being taught in the high school by a high school teacher. The transfer credit needs to be taught by a college faculty member on that college campus. Maybe one of you could tackle this question. Um, it seems like admissions has become much more competitive over the last, say, 10 years or so. Um, what do you attribute this to? Is it smarter kids, more applications? Okay, um, I, I think part of it is true um, because it is, 
it's a, and a lot has to do with the culture of the college going process. Uh, we, it's more competitive because it is not normal to submit just one application anymore, right? I had many classmates who did that. Um, I, it, it is extreme. I did hear a student last year who told me that they couldn't apply because the Common App capped it at 30 and they, we were choice number 31, but they really wanted to go. Obviously, those are really big extremes, but when you're applying to eight to 10 colleges, it's making it, the application numbers grow. It's harder for us to predict whether or not you will choose us, and so it does become a more selective process. But the other thing I wanna say about this is that the news about the college admission process is largely dictated by about 100 schools. And there are over 2,000 undergraduate institutions and 4,000 colleges that provide associate's degrees in this country. We are blessed with a lot of choice. For the majority of the colleges in our country, we accept more students than we deny. And so a lot of it is a, just a little bit of the conversation around it. Yes, it's a little bit more competitive, but I think just open your mind. We all said relax, everybody that was part of our process here, because if you're really balanced in your approach, it, it works out. And I think that that's a little frustrating, I would say sometimes, I and mean, we hear about lawsuits and different things going on, but it's all about these same top colleges. Those have always been very selective and they will continue to be selective. Um, and that's not where most students in the US end up. So I hope I did that justice. I do think something else that's coming into play too is social media. I mean, you hear about everything now because of social media, good, bad, and otherwise. And so that's why I think every single one of us said to go and visit campuses because you don't just want to hear about what's going on on College Confidential or you don't just want to hear about what we're putting out on our Twitter because we're going to tell you all the wonderful things on that. You want to get the feel for yourself. I think, Donnell, you talked about comparing NA students to other NA students. And I think I'm, I'm seeing a lot of questions that kind of allude to the fact that we have a very competitive high school with a lot of really high achieving kids. So if some of you could speak to the fact of, are you comparing NA to NA? Are you looking at the pile of NA transcripts and only taking the four sixes? How does that affect the process? And are the kids at a disadvantage? Yeah, so um, when I said that, and it's, it's more so just really realistically just contextualizing your experience that you have at NA, so we're not saying that we're only gonna take all the, the top 10% of those students, that's not the case at all, as, as in we only have, that we don't look at GPAs in that perspective, um, that's why I was using that in ex as an example, but when I said I was gonna compare NA to NA, it's more so just that we're not gonna compare you to Pine Richland or to Mars area. We're gonna make sure that we, are, we d thoroughly see how well that student was in, con in the context of NA, that they've done well at NA. Um, so we can very much so deny a student who is their number one, that, that, that is here just as much as we can accept the student that did very well here and is very much so well-rounded. So that academically is one thing, and uh, like I said, it's a very much so um, holistic review and 50-50 on matters of how well that student did contextualize at NA, as well as who they are as a person, their personal things that they provided, that uprosome profile that they've, they've chosen, and what can you do um, as much as what, what we can provide for you at Virginia Tech. So it's not more so comparing student to student or apples to apples, but which one um, is best for the fruit salad. What type of adjustments do you make to the application when the applicant is not a native speaker of English? I'm thinking it might be a little bit similar across the board. Non-native English speakers are often required to submit test scores, so um, we would ask for a TOEFL or an IELTS score uh, if that's possible. Um, and then for those students who might not check the box um, at, as a native speaker, but have been in, in instruction for since kindergarten of English language, um, we can waive at that if that's the case. Quick explanation on a super score, what that means. Got me. Okay. Um, super score is uh, the way that we work it. So if a student would take an SAT multiple times, say four or five times, um, we're always going to take out the highest score from the reading, writing, for, to the math. And we're always going to take out your highest two and combine them to make your super score. Okay, so you could have a score of 
1,200, 1,200, 1,200 each time, but your super score could actually be at 1,240, it could be at 1,250, um, just based on how you did in each section throughout. So we'll super score the SAT, um, also the ACT as well, and the four individual components. So it's important that students send in every score you take, or every test that you take. Um, I've talked to students in the past where, well, I didn't do as well on this one, so I'm not gonna bother sending that in when in reality it actually would have helped them because their super score would have went up, which could have been acceptance, maybe even more in scholarship funds. Um, so any tests that you take, regardless if your total score went down, make sure you send those in. Duquesne, do you post your merit scholarships anywhere? Uh, we do not post them online. We do not r give rank. Somebody asked if we um, report rank to colleges. So North Allegheny has a policy that we do not release rank. Um, last question before we get into the financial aid. Um, can you speak um, to providing services with, for students with disabilities um, who have IEPs or 504s um, at North Allegheny? I'll take that one first. So. I do think that students that um, have learning differences should consider a liberal arts uh, college simply because of that mentoring focus and emphasis that we have and that emphasis on the individual. Um, at Worcester, we do have a center that we call APEX. It's our academic planning and experiential learning center. So it encompasses all of those offices that really help students take what they learn in the classroom and put it um, to good use in the world and help them build those skills that they need to move on to that next step. And one of those offices within APEX is what we call our learning center. And so this is a staff that is dedicated to working with all students in terms of their academic preparation and success. But those students that do disclose that they have had accommodations and would like to learn more about um, that, those opportunities at Worcester, we try to connect those students very early on in the application process with the Learning Center so they can learn a little bit more about the services that are provided. But it's helpful to know that when you're in classes that are, you know, the average class size is about 15 to 16 students, they're going to get that attention that hopefully they feel they need and want. It's also really good advice to share that the student needs to take the initiative, right? We, we, um, it's some, what we find th in terms of the most challenging situation is a student has had an IEP or uh, you know, accommodations in high school, they come to Worcester, they might have one meeting with the Learning Center and then they kind of disappear and they fall off the radar and don't come to their meetings that, they, that were scheduled or recommended. And so we really want to encourage students to you know, really advocate for themselves, take those steps and take advantage of the resources in front of them. I think something to keep in mind also is start the process early. Every one of our campuses is going to accommodate your student. So, I mean, please do not worry. Whatever it is that they need, we are gonna accommodate them. Whether it's a temporary service or if it's something they need for the full time that they're at our campuses, we're gonna take care of them. And, but you need to start that process early because there's gonna be different paperwork that you need to do from high school to college and you wanna make sure you're getting all of the correct paperwork done. I know throughout the high school process, sometimes it can be a challenge and getting everything that your student needs. And I would love to tell you it gets easier and sometimes it does, but your student needs to be their own advocate also. So make sure that they're starting early, connecting with our offices and advocating for themselves that this is what I need. And we will make any accommodation that they need on any of our campuses, whether it's food, whether it's living conditions, whether it's in the classroom, anything that you, they need, we'll do. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thanks to our panel. Can we have a round of applause for our experts today? Thank you so much. We're going to have them come down and have a seat um, while we get ready to um, have our financial aid presentation. But as we are transitioning, I just wanted to let you know that the PowerPoints that we have up here, as well as the video of tonight, will be available on our Nash School Counseling site in a few days as soon as our tech people um, help us out with that and put it on the website for you. Um, also, mentioning the Nash School Counseling site, we really would encourage you to visit that site often, particularly our senior students who are in the process of applying 
We get a lot of questions that have the answers right on our Nash School Counseling site, so please check that out. There's a frequently asked questions about the common application. There are checklists on how you apply to school so that you can know all of the steps that you need to take have been taken. So please use that site as you can. And then also, in the back we had an evaluation form. If you would please take the time to fill that out. We do read every one of your evaluations. And if you've been with us for a few years, you've noticed changes in our evening presentations because we want to make sure that we are reaching you and we are giving you what you need. Um, this year we added slides and I think that was a really great addition. It helped us see the schools if we haven't been on campus yet and um, it'll give us something to refer back to when we watch it on the school counseling site. So please give us your honest feedback. We'd love to hear it. So with that, I'm going to have Meg Ryan come over to do the second part of her evening, which is the financial aid piece. All right, thank you. All right, the, this workshop is gonna be about 45 minutes long. Um, I'm gonna do my best to cover everything, but if anyone wants to stand up and stretch because it is a beautiful day and we've been sitting for a little while, that's why I'm standing, so I will take no offense to that. Um, like she said, my name's Meg. I'm gonna try to give you a little overview of what we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna start with just the basics of what is financial aid and why should you care about it now? So for seniors, that's pretty obvious. For the juniors and sophomores in the room, this is important in the process. We're gonna talk about the different types of financial aid as well as need-based versus merit-based. I'm gonna hopefully lift the curtain a little bit and try to help you understand why this process can seem a little confusing uh, because no two colleges really do this the same. I'll talk about alternative financing options and how to cover that gap after what you can pay and what financial aid comes up with, and then questions to ask as you visit college campuses. So let's start with the basics of what is financial aid. At the really core of it, financial aid is any financial assistance to help families cover the cost of attendance. This can come in the forms of need and merit-based. Those can be grants and scholarships. We often refer to grants and scholarships as gift aid. It's free money that you're not required to pay back. Financial aid also includes self-help money, so that also includes student loans as well as work study. So while you do have to earn or pay back what you borrow, that is considered financial aid. So sometimes people see that in a financial aid award and are only expecting gift aid. That's wonderful if that's what you have, um, but we all consider this financial aid, so this is really any financial assistance. This can come from a few different resources. It comes from the state and federal governments. It comes from the institution, and it can come from outside resources or third parties as well. The role of financial aid in the college choice is a big one. Uh, it's something that we really should start the process with, but all too often comes down to the wire. About 40% of students who decided not to go to their first choice cited cost as that number one reason why they did not enroll in their top choice. And about 60% of families eliminate a college from their college search list just because of cost, even before they get to the conversation with the institutions. So it's important that you're thinking about the college search process when it comes to cost. And for those parents in the room, I encourage you to include your students in the college cost conversation from day one. I've been working with financial aid and college admissions for over eight years, and I've had some really heartbreaking conversations, and a lot of times it's families not expecting what they're, they're coming to or um, not willing to have those tough conversations with students, um, and that can make for a really tough choice for that family. You should think about college as a long-term investment for both the student and the family. For those four years, it can sometimes mean lifestyle adjustments so that you can make larger payments towards a college. For those four years of enrollment, you also might be borrowing, and that can be on the student or the parent. So you wanna think about what does that mean in terms of what can we carry for loans, how do we pay that back, and how our lifestyle needs to be adjusted in that case. What you should keep in mind now as you're going through this process is what your financial aid expectations and needs are as well as any limitations that you have throughout the entire search process. So this is as soon as you start thinking about visiting colleges, I want you to th start thinking about college cost. There is something called the net price calculator. The net price calculator is required by any institution that receives federal forms or federal funds. So that is most of the colleges that you will be considering will have some sort of federal support, whether that's in research or financial aid dollars. That means that this tool exists somewhere on their website. It could be on an admissions financial aid page, it could be on a student services or business office page, it just depends on where they, they've located it, but you can go to these college search 
um, engines on their websites and find the net price calculator. And what it's gonna ask you to do is provide some information and with that, it will give you some historical perspective of what you can expect. So if you're looking for need-based financial aid, it'll say, you know, in your particular family situation, families similar to yours have received a ballpark figure of this. It is not a guarantee or commitment, but it's a good way to say, okay, if this is the price tag, what is what our actual out-of-pocket expense is going to be? If it's something that we can afford, then yes, let's book the ticket to California and go visit that school. But if you're gonna fly all the way across the country and then find out that that's not a school that you can really put on your uh, affordability list, then that makes for a really tough conversation if your student falls in love with that college. So think about it now, do the net price calculator. You can do it as many times as you want. You can do it at uh, this point in the time. You can also do it next year. Um, you can repeat it with new information. So it can be a really helpful tool. A lot of institutions often will, often will have early estimate forms as well, that's similar, but maybe it's a process that they run with a little bit more detail. So just check their website, read their website, and see what they recommend. Something to keep in mind about college costs is that both institutions and families are on a budget. So just like you might have that feeling of there's not another dollar that we can find in our wallet, some institutions sometimes have that feeling as well. So that's why it's important to know your expectations and what these colleges are doing early on in the process. Different types of institutions have different types of costs, so that's something to think about. I know it seems really obvious, but there's a difference between a state school, a state-related school, a private school, a community college. They all have different um, tuitions, different costs of attendance, and so that's something to think about. And then uh, different institutions will have different financial aid practices. So what their policies and practices are will dictate how you go through the process. When you're talking about college costs, I also want you to think about comparing apples to apples, which is really difficult. We don't make it easy because again, no two colleges really do it the same. But there's a difference between commonly used terms of tuition, cost of attendance, and net price. And so I want you guys to understand these concepts. A lot of people will come to campus and ask what tuition is. Depending on the type of institution, tuition can make up the largest part of their cost, or if you're looking at a state institution, room and board could be the same as the, the tuition. And so you really wanna understand what is the uh, tuition in context of all these other uh, forms of, of understanding numbers. Tuition really is the portion of college costs that covers the academic administration only. So it is only talking about enrolling in classes. What you should be talking about when you're talking to colleges is cost of attendance. This is the comprehensive cost for one academic year. Colleges will calculate their cost of attendance differently. It will likely include room and board, as well as any required fees that will be included on a bill. You can also often see things like travel expenses, and if you are, let's say, getting a financial aid package from two colleges that are very similarly located, they could have different travel allowances. So you, it gets a little confusing on that. Same thing with books. Books can be factored into a cost of attendance. That's usually a factor that you are not going to be billed for by the college but the college is trying to say, be prepared, this is another expense, and the cost of attendance is also an important number when it comes to what you can borrow or what you can earn in outside scholarships. So factoring in those additional costs, even though the college isn't going to bill you for it, the colleges are doing that so that you're setting your expectations really realistically. But again, it's gonna make it a challenge because you're gonna try to compare apples to apples. You really wanna look at what's included in those cost of attendance line items. And then net price is what you really should be thinking about. You can only think about net price if you're asking the right questions when you're visiting college campuses or if you're doing the net price calculator. And net price is your out-of-pocket expenses. So for families who might be receiving scholarship, then your net price is not the total cost of attendance. It's gonna be the cost of attendance minus the financial aid. The remaining balance is what you owe to the institution. That's your net price. So now talking about the different types of financial aid that you can receive in a financial aid award. Um, again, grants and scholarships, this is the ones that everybody wants. It's the free money that you're not required to pay back. It can come in, in form from institutional grants or scholarships. They can be need-based or merit-based. It can be in the form of a federal Pell Grant or the SEOG Grant. Those are federal guidelines in terms of who is eligible. Um, and when it comes to the federal Pell Grant, it literally is like tax brackets, a dollar more, you don't qualify, a dollar less you qualify. Um, and so you will find out when you file your FAFSA whether or not you're eligible for that. And then the state grant. Here in Pennsylvania, FIA is our higher education administrator. They provide the state grant. The Pennsylvania state grant has a reciprocity agreement with these states. So if you're attending school in 
uh, Massachusetts, you can take your Pennsylvania State grant with you. Those Massachusetts students who come here can take that Massachusetts grant with us. So we have a reciprocity agreement. That's said at the state level, the colleges don't get to pick and choose who gets that money. So if you're going to our neighbors in New York saying, please take my state grant, there's nothing they can do. Uh, you got to talk to your congressman on that one. Then we also have student loans. I mentioned that loans are considered financial aid and the federal direct loan is often included in a financial aid package. What you should know about the federal direct loan is that every student is eligible to borrow $5,500 the first year in the federal direct loan regardless of an application for financial aid eligibility. You just file a FAFSA and you're good to go. There's a difference between the subsidized portion of the loan and the unsubsidized portion. The subsidized portion is need-based. That means that it takes into account your family's need. We're going to cover how we get, get to that calculation in a minute. And that means that you are not earning interest for any portion that you're enrolled full-time. Six months after graduation, it starts to earn interest. The unsubsidized loan is earning interest from the moment it's dispersed into your account. The combination of those two will equal 5,500. If you're not eligible in your, um, for the subsidized loan, you can borrow the full amount in the unsubsidized loan. I'm saying this to you now because again, every college does this differently. So sometimes you're gonna see both the subsidized and the unsubsidized loan in a financial aid award. Sometimes you might see, not see any of it, and sometimes you might only see the subsidized. So it depends on what the institution does. So if you know this in the back of your head and you don't see it listed, you can know that that's another resource that you can use when it comes to covering the bill. Student loans are a reality in the marketplace today. 19% of all college costs are covered by student borrowing and 8% of all college costs paid in this entire country are covered by parent borrowing when it comes to student loans. And while there is a, a loan crisis and it is a conversation that we should have, the extremes are not the norm. And so keep the, the averages in mind and think about what you can carry. So this is something to think about now. So the average student loan debt for the US is under $30,000. The average student loan debt for Pennsylvania residents is a little bit higher. We average about $37,000. But I think one thing you want to consider is what are your long-term plans? If you're going on to medical school and you're planning to borrow for that, then maybe you need to minimize your loans now. If you know that you can carry $30,000 in loans, you're going to pay it off over an extended period of time, it's a great way to establish some credit history. Um, it's a good option and it can limit some other resources um, or some spending in some other areas. But there are some horror stories out there of people borrowing $120,000. Just don't let that scare you. That's not the norm. But also, don't be that student who's making that choice. Um, talk to your financial aid offices. Make sure that you're really making this a responsible choice. One thing I recommend is asking about a college's default rate. Default rates can often give insight on what that return on investment is. So if you're a def in default, it means you're not able to make payments to your student loans for an extended period of time. And so if we're a college is graduating students with an average loan debt that's much higher than the national average and their student default rates very high, it means that maybe those students are struggling to be employed. Um, maybe they're not able to get the right level of employment. Um, and so asking about a default rate is usually a good way to kind of get an idea of that investment that that college is making. I'll brag just a bit. Ours is 1.4 percent. Um, so that's pretty low. Um, but most of the private colleges, I will say, will have really low default rates. I think that that's just a good idea to put it in perspective. When it comes to work study, this is also considered financial aid. This is money that you do have to earn. So this falls into that self-help category. Um, the, there will be different employment policies when it comes to work study on different college campuses because we all do it a little bit differently. If you're awarded work study, it's typically based off of need. So that means that you have to have applied for financial aid to be eligible for a work study job. That doesn't mean that that's the only time you can work on campus. A lot of colleges will have lots of student job employment opportunities, but they might not be limited to work study students. Um, so even if you file for financial aid and you're not eligible for need based work study, you could still work on campus. If you do receive work study in a financial aid package, nobody's going to work that job for you but you. So you need to talk to the financial aid office to say, whose responsibility is it to get a job? Do I get assigned a job? Do I go get the job myself? It'll vary from institution. And then what do you do if I earn more than what I've been awarded here? Because there will be different policies. So let's say you get $2,500 in work study, but you earn $2,800. Sometimes that might mean you can't work much after that. Um, sometimes it could mean that the department's just going to pick up and pay that paycheck for you. So having conversations once you enroll is a really important part of that. 
Okay, so here's where we're gonna get into the nitty gritty and lift the curtain just a little bit to hopefully help you understand how we work through this process. Again, a number that I, or terms I want you to really be comfortable with is something called the expected family contribution. The expected family contribution is often referred to as EFC. In colleges, we use acronyms for everything. The EFC is the amount that the colleges use to evaluate a family's ability to pay for college. I stress ability because ability to pay and willingness to pay are oftentimes very different things. So the ability to pay for college is looking at a combination of directly contributing from income, drawing down on assets, and borrowing against assets. There's a couple things I can tell you about your expected family contribution. The first is that you probably won't agree with it. And the second is that there's nothing that you can do to change it. This is a calculation that colleges are using to attempt to take a very complicated process and lots of applications for financial aid and determine what families can contribute to make it an equitable process. Sometimes it's frustrating, but understanding this and going in armed I think is gonna hopefully help you. We calculate expected family contribution in a couple different ways. The first is called the federal methodology and the second is called the institutional methodology. I'm gonna talk about what those are in just a minute. But I wanna help you understand that the expected family contribution does not always equal your net price. This is a number that we use in, your, in a formula to calculate your financial aid eligibility. I'll go over that formula in a minute. This is something that's helpful to be knowledgeable about in the process, but ultimately the financial aid letter, the amount that you owe, that's what you need to focus on. And knowing your EFC will hopefully help. So let's talk about the financial aid philosophies. The first is a need-based financial aid. This is when schools are offering only need-based financial aid, the philosophy is really to ask families to contribute what they can so that they ask essentially all families to stretch a little bit and make that education attainable for e every applicant to the institution. It's a combination of grant and scholarships, work and loan programs in an attempt to meet the need of the family. We calculate the need of the family by taking the total cost of attendance, subtracting the expected family contribution, the leftover balance is your financial need. So if you know that number and you ask a college, do you guarantee to meet full need? That means if they say yes, that their financial aid award, any combination of grants, scholarships, loans, and work study, will equal your financial need. So that your, your out-of-pocket expenses only equal your expected family contribution in that case. So I mentioned that we can calculate your expected family contribution in a couple different ways. The federal methodology is, uses the FAFSA only, so it's taking the information off of the federal form, and it will use a, a formula that is set by Congress. All colleges will use this information to award all of your federal funds that you're eligible for. And then they also could use this information to calculate how they award their own individual uh, grants and scholarships. The institutional methodology is used by about 600 colleges. Institutional methodology is provided by the college board. So um, there are, like I said, about 600 colleges on there. It doesn't mean that colleges that are using a CSS profile, and I'll cover the forms in a moment, um, are automatically using the same institutional methodology. And that's where it gets really complicated. There are pros and cons to both of these formulas, but I'm just gonna give you some context of what we're doing with each of these cases. So in the federal methodology, they're gonna take into account how many people are in the household and how many people attend college in that household. And then we're gonna protect a certain amount of income and assets because you have to feed and clothe everybody who's living in that household. Now when it comes to the institutional methodology, they do the same. They ask about your number in household and the number in college. But then they also ask, of those students who are living in the, or of the dependents living in that household with you, how many are younger siblings? Because not only do you have to feed and clothe those younger siblings, you have to save for their college education, and hopefully you've already saved for their college education. So the institutional methodology is really helping in that case, so it's protecting more income and assets if you have younger children to hopefully account for that. When it comes to the federal methodology, it's gonna look at the custodial parent, and I will touch more on that in just a moment, and the custodial parent spouse. That is a requirement for the FAFSA. The institutional methodology provides colleges the option to ask for a third or non-custodial parent. So if the biological or adoptive parents don't share the same household, they might ask for another form. They might also consider that income, but the FAFSA is only gonna consider the primary household. The FAFSA looks at income and taxes, the CSS profile, their institutional methodology, looks at income and taxes, and specifically 
how you earned them. They make certain in, uh, selections based off of the colleges, so colleges could say, we don't want to allow for business losses because that's not something that every family has to go through, so that's not something we're going to account for. Whereas when it comes to the FAFSA, we're looking at the bottom line number on the taxes. So you see how the pros and cons start to work out here. Assets are considered. They'll ask you questions on both forms. But when it comes to the fe federal methodology, we do not ask about the primary household. Um, when it comes to the institutional methodology, the information about your primary household will be asked, and then colleges can make choices as to whether or not they want to use home equity as an available resource to add to the financial strength for that family. So it's applied the same way across all institutions when it comes to the federal methodology. The institutional methodology is a slightly more realistic way for colleges to account for things like it's more expensive to live in Pittsburgh than it is to live in um, State College, for example. So it accounts for little differences, but it also looks at every available dollar that the family has, so it strengthens the family's um, financial ability to contribute in some cases. When it comes to merit-based financial aid, this philosophy is to use the scholarship funds to attract st top students to enroll in their institution. So when it comes to um, academic or artistic, athletic ability, merit-based scholarships are used to really evaluate that and say that this is a student that we want to add to our student body. It can be a combination of merit and need-based, but it's something to think about when it comes to the merit-based uh, financial aid, um, what your contributions or um, eligibility might be for available for um, those particular institutions. Now when it comes to merit aid, everybody's going to award it a little bit differently. But something that you should be aware of is that something that's referred to as preferential packaging. That's simply that students with stronger or more desirable qualities for that particular class might receive preference when it comes to awarding a financial aid. So colleges use this as a recruitment tool, financial aid as a recruitment tool, to try to attract the strongest students. And they're going to use their own grant funding to improve the strength of a financial aid award. So when you're thinking about preferential packaging, where you sit in the application pool is important. This will help determine your financial aid award. So institutions will determine their own priority, and they're going to come up with um, how they're determining that scholarship internally. It's oftentimes a combination of many different things, but I'm going to solo or um, single out academics here and talk about, for instance, if your high school GPA was 3.8, and the average admitted student GPA for that particular college that you're looking at is 3.5, you sit at a pretty good spot in that applicant pool. You might be a really desirable candidate. And so for that reason, this is a good thing for you, and that might mean a stronger financial aid package, and in some cases, more merit-based financial aid. The opposite works as well. If the average admitted GPA is 3.8, and your average GPA is 3.5, there might be a stronger applicant in the pool that would be more desirable. Their financial aid package might be stronger. Yours might not be. So these are things to consider as you're looking at those academic profiles and visiting different colleges. And that will also explain why if you're what, looking at two similar colleges, they might not have the exact same calculation for financial aid um, because they could be using different need-based calculations than each other. And they could be using different merit-based calculations as well. So the basics when it comes to applying for financial aid. The first is to know the FAFSA. So I've mentioned federal methodology. I've mentioned the FAFSA. For seniors in the room, the FAFSA is open now. This is available for you to fill out. This stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And I will stress free. There are websites out there that will attempt to charge you to help fill this out. And I would say uh, it, sh it really is quite a simple form now. Um, it can seem complicated. Um, and it might take some time, depending on your individual family situation but I would encourage you to give it your best shot because you can even link your IRS taxes directly to the FAFSA. So when it's asking about parent income, you can pull the information right over. Um, there's also the CSS profile. Again, that's used by about 600 colleges. That is not used by all colleges. For example, Allegheny, we ask for the FAFSA only. No additional information, no information from anybody but the primary household. But the CSS profile is getting more and more common, so it's something to look out for. This typically does have a fee. It's usually $25 to submit, plus you pay then for every college you submit to, similar to applications. If colleges ask for um, uh, additional institutional forms, maybe they have uh, an additional form that you have to fill out for merit-based scholarships. They could have additional forms that you have to fill out if your parents don't share the same household. They could be something called a non-custodial parent form. They often can ask for primary documentation. 
So they can ask for tax returns, W-2 statements, they can ask for IRS tax transcripts. It will vary across institutions, so this is where spreadsheets start to come in handy. And then the timeline, again, it's available in October. Because it's available in October does not mean that you have to fill it out on, in October. A lot of times it's like that October 1 rush and you want to get it in right away. I usually encourage families to um, work alongside each other. So the FAFSA will ask questions, and the CSS profile for that matter, as though the student is filling out the form. We know it is very rarely the student filling out the form because it is asking income information. Um, but if the parents are working on the FAFSA at the same time that the students are working on their application, you shoot for similar timelines. Let's say you're applying early decision and you submit your FAFSA around that same time that they're submitting the application. That typically means that those colleges can provide financial aid information along with admission decisions. So that can often be helpful. For those, um, when you're filling out these forms, you're going to use in income information from two years prior to your enrollment. So if you're starting college in the fall of 2019, you're going to use your taxes from 2017 that you filed in April of 2018. So basically, parents, as you're filing your taxes in April, keep them handy because that fall you're going to use them for that information. I also provide this information because if you have an income that's really fluctuating or that had a dramatic change in one year, that's something to think about. The, the principle behind what we call prior, prior year is that for most American families, the fin uh, finances or income taxes don't change dramatically from year to year. Uh, but that's always not always the case if you, let's say, had a death in the family, you w went from two incomes to one because of a loss of employment or a divorce, or you ha or maybe work on commission or got a one-time bonus or took an IRA withdrawal in one year and you're not expecting it in future years. Those are times that you're going to want to speak to financial aid offices and ask about what your next steps are if you don't think that the year that you're using is reflective of a standard year for, for that family. Okay, so when it comes to parents who don't share the same household, so this is biological or adoptive parents who are not currently living in the same house. You could be legally separated, divorced, never married. It's just the two parents who are not sharing that same household. The parent who files the FAFSA is the parent with whom the student lives most of the year. And we usually say there are 365 days in the year, so even in cases of joint custody, there's typically one extra day. So if that's too challenging to, or to make that decision, then it's often the parent who provides more financial support during the previous 12 months when you're filing the FAFSA. So this is, has nothing to do with who claims the student on the taxes. So one parent can claim the student on the taxes, but the student can be residing with the other parent. If that student is residing with the other parent, that's who files the FAFSA. So this is a federal um, form that you're filling out. You're, you want to do it truthfully and honestly and keep that in mind. So now we call that primary parent the custodial parent. That's an uncomfortable word because when we talk about custody, you know, I know that a lot of families talk about joint custody. For the purposes of financial aid, you're going to hear custodial parent and non-custodial parent. And again, we acknowledge that that's sometimes a challenging terminology. But when it comes to this and the, fa the parent who filed the FAFSA, if that custodial parent is remarried, you are required to input step parent information on the FAFSA. This is a federal choice, it is not a college choice, and it is just because you might have made decisions about who's paying for college, it doesn't mean that the federal government made those same choices, um, so they're going to ask for that step-parent income information. Then when it comes to a non-custodial parent, the information may be requested by the institution, it may not be, it just depends, you want to ask, um, do you ask for that non-custodial parent form or waiver or whatever the case might be. Oftentimes it's with institutions that use the CSS profile. Um, and then the non-custodial parent information is included, but it is not included in federal or state eligibility requirements. So the federal and state eligibility is always using the um, federal methodology and the FAFSA information. Deadlines to keep in mind. May 1st of your senior year is the deadline for applying for PA state grants. So that's also when you're choosing your college. So hopefully you have your FAFSA in well before then. But for those who might be considering community college or maybe just taking a little longer to fill everything out, get it in by May 1st so that you can just see if you're eligible for any of the FIA grants. Institutional deadlines for financial aid, again, spreadsheets are the best recommendation here. Um, there, there will be different institutional deadlines when it comes to scholarships. We heard that earlier tonight. Some institutions will have different scholarships and to, in order to be eligible for that scholarship, you must apply early action as an example. 
Um, so keeping in mind how you're going to apply, how that works with application deadlines, that's really important. And then enrollment and application deadlines. So as you're focusing on all of this, if you miss an application deadline, that's a moot point. Um, and if you don't tell the colleges that you're planning to enroll by a certain college time, then that can jeopardize financial aid. So keep those in mind. So now that you have your financial aid award, and you hopefully you fully understand it, you are looking at the bill, you're wondering how you're going to close that gap um, of what you owe and what you poten potentially can pay. The first is to talk about alternative loans. I mentioned that student loans are reality today. Those averages that I provided to you include both private and federal student loans for the national and Pennsylvania averages. But student loans, um, so private student loans can be a good option. They often require a student to have a co-signer, so parents are usually co-signing, um, but that means that it can be a joint effort to pay back the student loans, or it could be you know, a combination or just on the student themselves. Um, but it is uh, a tied to the, the parent's credit application. Then there are also alternative loans to consider. So home equity loans can be an option. Um, there's obviously some risk with that, and so we want to really think about what the family can handle in terms of that long-term investment. These loans can come from federal government as well as a variety of different lenders. Colleges will not recommend and should not be recommending different private lenders, but we will always tell you about the Federal Parent PLUS loan. The Federal Parent PLUS loan has a fairly simple application, has a lower credit threshold than most private loans, but it does have a higher interest rate. So it, it's about an 8% interest rate this year. Um, and a lot of private loans can beat that. So it depends on, again, what your circumstances are. Do your research, um, but the only one that colleges are ever going to advise you on is going to be the Federal Parent PLUS loan. That doesn't mean you can't go find a more competitive rate out there. Things to consider, ask about interest rates, deferment options. If you're planning to go on to graduate school, can you defer payments? What does that look like? And payment plans, penalties for paying back early, what those cases might be. Outside scholarships, it is never too early to start looking, so please start now, and you should not stop until you graduate. Um, outside scholarships are great. They bring in additional resources um, with you to whatever schools you go to, um, and there will be different policies um, at different institutions as well about outside scholarships, but in general, they're typically helping you reduce your bill in some way, whether that's reducing what you pay or what you borrow. Talk to your counselors, look locally, apply for the smaller scholarships. It is wonderful if you can get the all expenses paid tuition scholarship. Somebody has to win it, go ahead and apply. But don't take, spend a lot of time on those because those will see tens of thousands of applications. $500 here, $1,000 there. Don't sniff at those because those will add up and that is $500 that you don't have to pay out of your pocket. There are scholarships for everything that you can think of. There's literally a scholarship out there that's called Tall and Don't Play Ball and you have to be over 5'11 as a female or 6'4 as a male, and you write an essay about what it's like to be a tall person that doesn't play basketball. I mean, these, there can be a scholarship out there for anything. I say look throughout your enrollment as well, because after you declare a major, there can typically be scholarships for women in STEM, um, men in nursing, you know, whatever the case might be. Um, and so if you've declared a major maybe later on in the process, there could be other resources out there. There can also be study abroad scholarships. So if you've got a scholarship specifically to go study in a, in a country from maybe that country's consulate or something like that, that can be helpful. So keep looking. Here's a couple resources. I definitely recommend FastWeb. Basically sets up a search engine for you and then bombards you with email reminders to say this deadline's approaching, this deadline's approaching. So um, it can be helpful, um, but definitely is something that I would recommend. Other things to think about, payment plans. So check with your institution. Um, the institution that you're enrolling can have installments. So while you might be looking at one big number on the financial aid award letter, um, paying what you can uh, over a semester or over several months could limit what you need to borrow. And that ultimately is helpful because it limits what you need to pay back. And then I'll wrap up here with some questions to keep in mind for those who are going on college visits now. Again, at any point throughout the college process, things that you should be asking. Do you practice need-blind admission? Need-blind admission means that we make an admission decision first, regardless of any application for financial aid. So we're not even gonna look at whether you applied or what your expected family contribution is. First, we make an admission decision. It's not influenced by that. And then we calculate a financial aid award. There are pros and cons to need-blind admission. So you're gonna hear from schools that say, we're not need-blind, we're need-sensitive. Um, we're need aware that um, if you're need blind, it means, you know, if you're qualified, that's great, but your financial aid package might be tough. If you're need aware, it might mean that you're only allowing options for families that where you can really commit to providing those financial resources. So I think just knowing what you're walking into is best, but there's not one right or wrong answer. 
um, but that might help you understand you know, how that factors into an admission decision. Simple question, do you offer merit-based scholarships? If so, what are the requirements to apply? What are the deadlines? Do you guarantee to meet full need? Hopefully you'll have that formula in mind of cost of attendance minus your expected family contribution, and then are you guaranteeing to meet that need? What is your financial aid deadline and what forms do you require? Can I expect to receive similar financial aid package for all four years, assuming my circumstances don't change? Are any of these scholarships conditional on my program enrollment? If I'm no longer a music major, do I still get to keep this scholarship? Something along those lines. If you have two kids in college in the year that you apply for financial aid, your expected family contribution is being divided among two kids. One of them graduates, your expected family contribution stays the same, but now it's all on one student. So if it's a need-based financial aid award, it can sometimes be adjusted, and so that's something to be expecting. So can I expect it? If it's need-based, they might say, when that student graduates, it's gonna change a little bit. What is your outside policies, or policy on outside scholarships? Um, every institution does this differently. We have some federal guidelines that we have to abide by, so sometimes your federal work study and oftentimes subsidized loan can be impacted, um, but again, it typically is beneficial to get outside scholarships, um, but ask the college. When will I get my financial aid award letter? I say this because a lot of students panic. Um, at a, some institutions, financial aid and admissions work really closely together, and so if you're mailing a whole bunch of letters one day, you can't turn around and mail the financial aid awards some at the same time. In others, they work really closely in a different way, and the financial aid letter is in the, award, the admission decision letter. So don't panic if you don't see a financial aid letter, because they're not all gonna be the same. So just know what to expect. How does the financial aid application or policy differ from early decision to early action? Is there anything along those lines to be aware of? Um, is the, if the financial aid award is insufficient, can I appeal for more financial aid? Doesn't hurt to ask, that's what I always say. If the school says, nope, it is what it is, you're exactly where you started. If the school says, we wanna know a little bit more about your circumstances, then you could be better off. And then any special circumstances that you might have. So if you feel like your family situation is not represented well on these forms, you have different changing um, income, your um, family situation is difficult, uh, always know those special circumstances and ask when you're on campus. Call the financial aid office, they're always happy to help. They're usually, tr we have most financial aid counselors I know will stay on the phone with you while you file the FAFSA because so many people make mistakes, we'd love to avoid that. Um, but really call the college, they'll be as helpful as they can. And then lastly, I just wanna wrap up here with a comment on return on investment. Return on investment is measured in a lot of different ways. And there are some resources out there like the college scorecard, asking about default rates, asking about employment rates or grad school acceptance rates that can help you. And some schools try to standardize this in some way. But ultimately, it's up to you to decide what the investment is. If you're thinking about your investment in terms of getting you onto the next phase of life, then you wanna ask specific questions about that. You wanna think about different rankings or whatever it might be that's influencing you. If you are thinking about your investment in terms of that one four-year experience that is so unique and as part of that experience, you need to have access to whatever it might be, large college sports, one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Think about what that investment is and ultimately you decide how to measure that return on investment because there really is no standard way. And I can, can say that the first year out of college is not gonna be the same way that you feel 10, 15, 20 years out of college. I think most parents would agree with that when they think about their experiences. So really just, I would say, evaluate that, and then while you're on these college visits, ask the questions that influence how you're gonna really uh, measure that return. So I will close there, and I will turn it over to Jen to see if there is any questions I can answer. Oh, we got questions. All right. <laughs> One thing I just wanted to say that I found out today, you can use a 529 to pay for the college and high school classes. So that was new information to me, so maybe some of you are thinking about that as well. Um, do you see private schools having more flexibility with financial aid? Do private schools have more flexibility? In general, I would say yes, because um, federal and state regula regulations are um, difficult to work with, but it also means that um, private schools oftentimes have limited budgets just as well, so. A lot of questions about citizenship and immigration status and mm -hmm. applying for financial aid. Is there a statement you can make kind of about that? Sure, when it comes to the FAFSA and the federal um, uh, methodology, you must be a US citizen or permanent resident. That is the student who's applying. It does not have to do with the parent's um, citizenship status or immigration status. 
If you're a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, go ahead and file the FAFSA. Um, if you are not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, it's going to vary by college. So for students who have DACA status or for students who are here on a visa status, you're going to have to ask the college, but you will not be eligible for federal or state financial aid. Does retirement savings, mm. is retirement savings considered in the, uh, in the application? Yeah, uh, standard retirement savings are not. So 401ks, 403bs are not considered on the financial aid application. It is not a question on the FAFSA. Um, however, it is a question on the CSS profile. The questions on the CSS profile are like the common application. Every school gets them, but not all schools use them in the same way. So it's asked because some schools might use it in maybe an appeal to try to consider, okay, this family does have savings, so maybe they can stretch a little bit more. But in, a, in both formulas, standard financial or retirement accounts are not considered when it comes to calculating the expected family contribution. If you're saving in a non-traditional way, though, there's nothing that can be done. So if you're saying my stocks are my retirement, it's considered an asset, and you're going to report it in that way. A lot of questions about 529 plans. Um, some families think they could maybe even be Pell eligible, but maybe grandpa started a 529, it's in the student's name, a custodial account. You know, if it's a family who has a lower income, but there is a savings, how would that play out in the financial aid equation? Yeah, so uh, financial aid equations factor in both income and assets. Um, assets that are listed in the student's name are gonna be expected to be used for college, so that includes most 529 plans. You do file for financial aid every year, so how you use those plans are up to you. And if you're drawing down on the um, 529, you're going to report your financial aid next year with less assets. So you could might not be eligible in your first year, um, but you could increase your eligibility with time, um, depending on how you're using those funds. If you have multiple children and you filled out the FAFSA prior, do you use the same login for the different child? You will have an FSA ID for each different child's application. What if you have more than 10 colleges that you're applying to? How do you represent those on the FAFSA? Yeah, so you should know that when the FAFSA is submitted to colleges, it's just submitted to colleges. They don't know what order you submit to the college, but what they, what they do um, receive is only the active uh, applications. So if you have 10 schools that you're applying to, if you list 10 schools, Let's say you add an 11th school, you go into, I'm going to say, let's go, you call Allegheny and say, did you guys get your, my FAFSA? We say yes. You can go back into the FAFSA, you can remove Allegheny, you can add an 11th school and submit again. Now, what you should know is if you make updates, let's say you realize you made a mistake, Allegheny doesn't get your update. So you got to go back in, add Allegheny back and make that update. Um, but you can certainly resubmit and add an 11 school in that case. Just make sure that they received your FAFSA first. Do colleges see those schools that are listed and do they? We do not, nope. We do not see the competitor schools listed on the FAFSA. What if a family would like to move to say Virginia and take up citizenship there so they can go to Virginia Tech? I'm going to look at Donnell on that <laughs> and ask about. How, how might that work yeah. out if a family moves? Different states will have different requirements for in-state residency, so I'll have you touch on that. Yeah, so uh, and, and the result of that question has a very domicile question, uh, but in that event, what do you do to dictate conditions? If you do move to Virginia, you will have to take up residency at least once a year. Do you establish that residency in Virginia uh, for that for a student who will move back into the Virginia camp? Do you not do you do once a year uh, establish re residency in Virginia and then do you not apply for residency? Yes, and we recently learned that in Utah, your parents don't have to move there. You just have to move there. So every state does it differently, um, uh, and you can set up um, re in-state residency if you want to go to the University of Utah. And I've heard that a lot about a lot of other states, too, the one year. Somebody asked about divorced parents or a parent being deceased. Mm -hmm. What about a deceased parent? I know you touched on divorced parent before. Yeah, um, deceased parents' are n income and assets are not reported because uh, at that point, assets would have been transferred. Do you look at credit scores of students for yep. financial aid? No, we do not look at credit so scores for students. Um, it would be pretty quick. Most most 18 year olds don't have them. Um, but no, it's not something that we ask or, or evaluate. This is probably college specific and maybe since you're standing there, Meg, you can just talk to Allegheny mm -hmm. average 
cost of attendance after a financial aid package is considered? Do colleges have that information available? Like this is really what our yeah. cost is, but really most people pay. Yes, do colleges have that available? Yes, averages are just that, averages. So use the net price calculator. The net price calculator is the average for families with your income. It's for average for families with, in cases where merit-based aid is awarded, it's the average for families with your income and your student's GPA. The net price calculator is your best tool because there are way higher and way lower than those averages. So I would say don't let cost scare you. Um, many schools that have high costs also have high financial aid, um, but uh, use the net price calculator to determine what the final outcome might be. Uh, that's the best way. Thank you. All right. One thing I just want to point out that, that Meg had said is she shared that little picture of your GPA is this, but the average is this, and then vice versa. Um, I'm seeing as a counselor a lot of students applying to so, so, so many REACH schools. And if they could apply to schools that are maybe within REACH, um, they may end up seeing better financial aid packages. So I just want to throw that out there that when you're looking at schools where you surpass the middle 50%, of test scores and GPAs, you might be pleasantly surprised by your tuition package. Danelle? Thank you. Thank you so much for your wonderful questions. We really appreciate you all sticking around. Um, the five college admissions reps, as well as Mrs. Belosky and I will be hanging out down here if you have more individualized questions that you would like to ask us. Um, we really appreciate your coming out tonight. We hope this was helpful. Please, please fill out the evaluation so we know how to plan this for next year. Thank you so much.